And of course, we'll be reading to 398. Praise God. Amen. The Jewish leaders announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the, from the synagogue. And of course, we can equate that now to the church. Can you imagine not being able to say the name of Jesus in your church? Not being able to say the name of your saving church? That's just mind boggling to me. A generation after Jesus lived on earth, his followers continued to face threats like this one recorded in the Gospel of John. And this is one of the key reasons why the book was written. For Jews living throughout the Roman Empire, uh, local synagogues gave them an ongoing uh, connection to their ancient story and people. Expulsion from the synagogue meant being cut off from the community that had embodied God's covenant people for centuries. But John's gospel assures followers of Jesus that they have not been excluded from God's story. Jesus embodied the deepest meaning and ultimate fulfillment of Israel's most vital symbols, festivals, and practices. The gospel opening line, in the beginning, echoes the opening words of Genesis, revealing that John is telling a story of a new creation. God's ongoing work to restore his world through Abraham's family finds its continuity in the work of Jesus the Messiah. John's gospel reads very differently from the other three, being less a narrative biography and more a portrait of Jesus drawn against the backdrop of Israel's history. Its purpose is to invite readers, both ancient and present, to be confident in their belief that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. The author of the book traditionally considers to be the Apostle John, though he doesn't identify himself by name, tells the story of Jesus' life in two major parts. The first part has seven sections. Each relates what happened when Jesus took a journey and explored his identity in light of the key elements from Israel's history. The centerpiece of this part of the book is the fourth section. The other six sections are paired with one another thematically from the outside in as shown below. Of course, you have to turn the pages to see what it means by shown below. And so it's, a, it's an interesting uh, diagram that they have for us. Um, you know, they actually uh, taught us something like this in the seminary. Uh, to, to show us how the the end of the story, the relationship between the end and the beginning, and where the center of the story is. And so that's why you see the alphabets um, ascending and descending. It's actually one of those tools uh, that they teach you uh, in seminary to draw out the center or the theme uh, of the whole book. It's pretty awesome that they did that in here. Uh, of course, A, Jesus, in light of a new creation, that gives you your pages there. Jesus, uh, the re relationship to the temple. And then Jesus in light of the Sabbath and in conflict with the Jewish religious leaders. And then in the center, Jesus as a new Moses against the backdrop of the Exodus. And then C, Jesus in light of the festivals of shelter and in conflict with the Jewish religious leaders. And you notice that the C's line up. I want y'all to kind of get how they um, this tool is used. So the C's line up. Jesus in relationship to the temple uh, dedicated festival. See how it lines up. The B's line up. And then the A, Jesus in light of the resurrection. So you go from creation to resurrection. It's pretty interesting. Near the end of each section, the author describes how people uh, did or did not believe in Jesus after everything they had seen and heard. A recurring theme of the Gospel of John is the number seven. For Jews, this number in, indicates a consummation, consummated work of God and recalls the completeness, completeness represented by the seven days of creation, often called the Book of Signs. This first part of the Gospel details Jesus performed seven mighty signs that revealed his glory. 
The gospel also contains seven discourses, which are long speeches in which Jesus unveils more about who he is. Finally, we find Jesus presenting seven I am's uh, statements in the gospel. These statements draw on the rich stock of imagery from the first testament, uh, including the bread of life and the good shepherd, the gate and the vine. The second part of the book, uh, going from uh, pages 424 uh, to 436, essentially tells the story of Jesus' final days. It begins with the last Passover meal with the disciples following, followed by a long presentation of his instructions to them. Jesus speaks of the meaning of his death, the battle against the rulers of this world, and he prays for, uh, to the Father for the unity of his followers which will enable the world to believe their message about Jesus after he departs. Jesus then enters into the glory through his obedient death, which is why this part of the gospel is often called uh, the Book of Glory. Before, it brief, before its brief epilogue, the gospel closes by telling uh, Jesus' resurrection on Sunday morning and the first day of the week with Jesus, the life and peace of God's new creation truly has broken into the world. Praise God. There's Sharon. Praise God. All right. So that was good. But to uh, even bring more clarity, of course, you know, I did uh, a little presentation so that y'all can get a little bit more depth. So uh, I do include uh, the video, which I love from the Bible Project. Uh, you know I love these guys. If y'all haven't taken advantage of it, uh, you ought to. The Bible Project breaks it down into two parts, just like we read uh, in the Messiah book. Uh, part one goes from uh, chapters 1 to 12, and then part two, 13 to 21. Um, the Bible Project, that team is phenomenal. I love them. So uh, enjoy the video. I'm only going to give you the first part. And then when we get ready to go into the second part, uh, I'll just do the video and then whoever is leading for that particular uh, night uh, will uh, go ahead and lead. And I'll just do the little uh, introduction to uh, chapter 13 to 21. So let's enjoy this. The Gospel According to John. It's one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life. And we learn at the end of the book that it comes from one of Jesus' closest followers called the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he appears many times in the story itself, and there's some debate about whether it's John the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve, or a different John, who lived in Jerusalem and was known in the later church as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, the book embodies his eyewitness testimony, and it's been brilliantly designed with a clear purpose that he states near the end. John says, the story is written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing you may have life John believes that the Jesus you read about in this book is alive and real, and that he can change your life forever. The book's design is really cool. Its first half opens with an introductory poem and a short story that's followed by then a big block of stories about Jesus performing miraculous signs that generate increasing controversy. And it all culminates in his greatest sign, the raising of Lazarus, which creates the greatest controversy as Israel's leaders decide to kill Jesus. And that launches into the book's second half. These chapters focus on Jesus' final night and last words to his disciples, which are followed by his arrest, trial, death, and resurrection. The book concludes with an epilogue. In this video, we're just going to focus on the first half. So the book opens with a two-part introduction. First, a poem that begins, in the beginning, was the word. An obvious allusion to Genesis 1, when God created everything with his word. Now, a person's words, they're distinct from that person, but they're also the embodiment of that person's mind and will. And so John says that God's word was with God, that is distinct. And yet the word was God, that is divine. And as we ponder this claim, we hear later in the poem that this divine word became human in Jesus. Then John goes on to draw from the stories of Exodus, saying that Jesus was God's tabernacle in our midst. The glorious divine presence that hovered over the Ark of the Covenant became a human in 
Jesus. Which leads to his last claim, that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Son, who has become human to reveal the Father to us. Now, as we consider these mind-bending claims, we then start to hear a story about how John the Baptist first met Jesus and then led other people to meet him and become his disciples. And one by one, as people encounter Jesus, they say out loud who they think he is. And in this one chapter, Jesus is given seven titles. Now, these titles prepare us for John's love of the sevens in designing the book, but altogether, they also make a claim that this fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the messianic king, he's the teacher of Israel, and he's the son of God who will die for the sins of the world. Now that's a big claim to make about someone, and John will now go on to support it through the stories in chapter 2 through 12. They all have the yeah, same basic pattern. Jesus will perform a sign or make a claim about himself, and that will result in misunderstanding or controversy. So in the end of each story, people really? are forced to make a choice about who they think Jesus is. The first section shows Jesus encountering four classic Jewish issues, and in each case, Jesus shows that he is the reality for which that is the point. So Jesus is at a wedding party and the wine runs out. And Jesus then turns a huge jug of water, the blue speakers in the office. total, into the best wine hmm? ever. And the head waiter right. says to the groom, you saved the best wine for the past, which is, of course, true. But John also calls this miracle Jesus' first sign. In other words, it's a symbol that reveals something about Jesus. So just as Isaiah said that the Messianic kingdom would be like a huge party with lots of good wine, so this first miraculous sign reveals the generosity of Jesus. Next, Jesus goes to the Jerusalem temple, the place where heaven and earth were supposed to come together and God would leave with his people. And Jesus asserts his authority over it, running out all the money exchangers, stopping the sacrificial offerings. And when the temple leaders threaten him, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Jesus is claimed that his coming sacrificial death is where heaven and earth will truly be together. His body that will be killed is the reality to which the temple building points. Then Jesus has this all-night conversation with a rabbi named Nicodemus, who thinks that Jesus is just like him, another rabbi and teacher of Israel. But Jesus says that Israel needs much more than just another teacher with new information. Israel needs a new heart and a new life. Or in his words, no one can experience God's kingdom without being born again. Jesus believes that humans are caught in a web of selfishness and sin that leads to death. But he also knows that God loves this world. And so he's here to offer people a new birth, a new chance at life. From here, Jesus travels north, and he ends up at a sacred well in a conversation with a Samaritan, that is a non-Jewish woman. And they start talking about water, which Jesus turns into a metaphor for him. He says he's here to bring living water that can become a source of eternal life. Now in John, this term refers to a new quality of life, one that's infused with God's eternal love, and it's a life that can begin now and last on into the future. After this, John has designed another collection of stories that took place during four Jewish sacred days or feasts. And again, Jesus uses the images related to the feasts to make claims about himself. So Jesus first heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath, which starts a controversy with the Jewish leaders about working on the day of rest. And Jesus says it's his father who's working on the Sabbath, and so is he. And they catch his meaning, that he was calling God his father, making himself equal with God, and so they want to kill him. The next story takes place during Passover, the feast that retold the Exodus story with the symbolic meal, ham, bread, and wine. And Jesus miraculously provides food for a crowd of thousands, which results in people asking him for more bread. And then Jesus goes on to claim that he is the true bread, and if they eat him, they will discover eternal life. And this offends many people who stop following him. After this is a block of stories set in Jerusalem during the Feast of the Tabernacles, which retold the story of Israel's wilderness wanderings as God guided them with the pillar of cloud and fire and provided them water in the temple. And Jesus gets up in the temple courts and he shouts, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. And then later he says, I am the light of the world. He's claiming to be the illuminating presence of God and the light of the gift of God. And some people believe and follow him, but others are offended, and still others try to kill him for these exalted claims. 
The final feast story is during Hanukkah, which means rededication. It's about how Judah Maccabee cleared the temple of idols and set it apart as holy once more. And Jesus goes into the temple area and says that he is the one God has set apart as the holy one, and that he is the true temple where God's presence dwells. And he also says, I and the Father are one. This makes the Jerusalem leaders so angry, they set in motion a plan to kill Jesus, and so he retreats. Now all these conflicts, they culminate in one last miraculous time. Jesus hears that his dear friend Lazarus is dead, but his family lives near Jerusalem, which is now a death trap. Now, Jesus could stay away, and he would save his own life, but he loves Lazarus. So once he hears that Lazarus has died, he goes to raise him from the dead. He calls him to life out of his knowing that it will cost him his own life. And the news of this amazing sign, it spreads quickly, of course, and just as Jesus knew it happened, the Jerusalem leaders hear about it and begin conspiring to murder him. And so he rides into Jerusalem as Israel's king, who is rejected by its leaders. So the first half of John draws to a close with this story about Jesus laying down his life as an act of love for his friend. And this, of course, is also a sign pointing forward to the cross, which we'll explore more in the next video. But for now, that's the first half of the Gospel of John. All I can say to that is awesome. You know, I really, really love that. That was, that was awesome. You know, I, I love that um, presentation. Um, so uh let's see oh we can't hear y'all oh man i didn't get that message because i was in screen um powerpoint mode uh i'm gonna have to uh take care of that but anyway um you can always call it up on youtube and if you call it up on youtube uh it's the bible project uh the book of john and uh, you can uh, take a look at it uh, at your leisure uh, the next part of this thing, you know how I love Chuck Swindoll? Uh, I really like that dude. That dude, man, he ain't nothing but the truth. Uh, so let's take a look at Chuck. Uh, his outline is very, very uh, insightful. And so I want y'all to take a look at this. Let's see if I can get this out of the way. There we go. Put that up there. All right. So Chuck, Chuck breaks this thing down uh, as well. Uh, and he breaks down the entire book. Uh, and y'all can take notes from this if you, if you like, uh, but he actually takes what uh, the Messiah introduction said, and he takes what the Bible project says, and he puts it in this wonderful graphic uh, where it displays uh, all the information like on a single page. So, I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. And so it starts off, you can see at the top, uh, the book uh, from chapter one uh, uh, to uh, verses one to 13, it's all about the word was God. That whole part, that prologue is about the word was God. And then the second one is that God, God became man, you know, and that takes you through chapter four, uh, almost to chapter five. And then it talks about the ministry of Christ. And, uh, and then it goes from there to his discourses. And, you know, they said that, that are, those are his long uh, speeches uh, that he gives uh, and teachings. Then it goes to his trial and death. And then uh, it goes to the empty tube in 20. And then uh, the assurance, we're talking about uh, basically the resurrection and him proclaiming our, our future, uh, which is awesome. And then you can see how they break it down in these stages. It's so cool. You know, you get the prologue where it talks about the deity, his acceptance uh, as a man. Then, of course, the conflict that he had with the Jewish leaders uh, in his ministry uh, and the doubters. Uh, and then, of course, the preparation. Uh, and that was the preparation for his, uh, his uh, passion. Uh, and then, of course, the crucifixion itself, and then his, tri his triumph, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and then he looks at this. Look at this right here, the audience. Uh, first is a public message, then it's private. The last half is him really giving instructions 
to his disciples, kind of preparing their hearts uh, to uh, be able to uh, carry the word on after he he raises from the dead. Uh, and that second half really centers around uh, the last week of his life. You know, it's putting it all in this nice, nice little package where he can um, hopefully prepare his disciples uh, to, to turn the world upside down, you know. And then uh, below that, uh, we get to the seven I am's. Now we talked about that in the Messiah book when I gave you the introduction. And you can see, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Those are all in the in the last seven days of the second half of um, the book of John, where he's having these conversations with his disciples, reassuring them exactly to who he was. And they say the theme, Chuck says the theme of the whole book is salvation comes only through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Somebody can say amen to that. Uh, and then the Christ, where is Christ in the book of John? Chuck uh, Swindoll loves to do this. He likes to find Christ in every book uh, that he outlines. And of course, the Christ in John is probably one of the easiest books to find. I mean, the easiest center to find. So you see, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, uh, who alone is the revelation of God and salvation uh, of the people. You know, and I mean, that's that's really, that's really an easy thing. Really easy thing. Now he says, the key verse, uh, Chuck Swindoll says, the key verse is 20, 21. And I happen to agree with that um, because this is like the thrust of what this is all about. Uh, this is the New Revised Standard. And of course, verse 21 says, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As my father has sent me, so I send you. Now, y'all got to believe that's what this is all about. Christ is preparing the people to be sent. And guess what? He's preparing uh, the people to be sent and also for them uh, to become um, uh, mentors of those who will be sent as well. So the senders are supposed to send others uh, in that same mission of reconciliation. Uh, they're supposed to be sent as well. So uh, that's the overview of John in a nutshell. And uh, I would like to see what y'all got out of the reading uh, this week uh, for the introduction. So uh, I'll give everyone a chance to uh, chime in. Uh-oh, we lost Sharon. Okay. All right. Tell me what you think of the reading this week. I'm hoping everybody did the reading this week. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. I, I just still can't get over um, the first leader. Um, even though he's going around performing all these signs and miracles. That's that was, just something I, I could never get over uh, reading over the uh, scriptures. Anybody else? Wow, no comments. Okay. Well, I hope y'all are uh, got your hearts and minds set to jump into the book of John. You know, like I said, it's one of my favorite books. Uh, there are some amazing uh, historic uh, scriptures that have founded our faith and founded um, our, our foundation actually in Christ. Uh, all in the book of John. I mean, everybody knows John 3.16. Everybody knows John 1.1. 1, 1. 
you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, the word was God. All of that we are going to go into in our examination of the book of John. I know it's going to bless your socks off. I just hope that um, these these uh, conversations that we have, um, you got to do your homework. You got to you got to do your readings. Um, and if you want to do the background with the commentaries, you got to do that uh, to get the depth, to get the richness out of the text, because you don't want to just do a surface reading. Um, many have already done that. I mean, we already said, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. But what does that mean? And what was the context of that? And what was the relationship of that comment? Since we know that it says in the beginning, just like it did in Genesis, what is the relationship between John and Genesis? What is the relationship between the idea or the theme of creation in Genesis and the theme of creation in the book of John? There are so many uh, powerful themes that are in the book of John that really, um, we could take a year and go through the book of John. Uh, so it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. Uh, I hope you all uh, really prepare so that we can go even deeper uh, uh, in the text, because I know you're going to really uh, get a lot more out of it. Praise God. All right. Praise God. Any uh, other comments before we uh, close out in prayer? Yeah, well, I have more of a question. Um, what I liked about, well, I just want to make a comment. Um, I just love in the book of John how um, it really God really it really shows Christ as the creator you know that comes out that's the part that really you know really that I really love about this book but I was trying to have a better understanding and I kind of you kind of you touched on it but I wasn't clear on where it was saying um when he gives the A, B, C, D thing, I'm lost with that. Can you kind of uh, clarify that just a little bit more? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's just a study tool um, that I, 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 I have to say they do it in seminary. Uh, they taught us how to do this. The way they outline uh, the entire book to get to um, um, themes. As a matter of fact, if you turn to it, you see what I'm talking about to get to the key themes of the book. And so what they will do, they will identify the key themes in the first half and the key themes in the second half. And that's actually a good technique to examine when you're trying to examine a, a large book. John is one of the largest books in the, in the uh, New Testament um, with 21, 21 chapters. So, uh, to really outline that book and digest it, then you would use something like this. And so, um, like I said, what it does is tr it draws you into the center of what this is all about. As far as the person that does this, uh, I can't remember the proper name of it for some reason, it, it, it eludes me. I'll have it next time we uh, we come together. But um, yeah, it, it, it draws, your your attention to the to the center central theme of the book and so the person that does this uh when they outline the book this is how they view the book now if i would have done this i use this tool i may have come up with different themes not totally different things because the word is the word you know it's still the same text but i may have been drawn um drawn to something a little different you know looking at those uh, those themes now they're using the messiah book to draw their themes the messiah messiah bible the immersed messiah bible they're using that but uh, we use uh something like you know the king james or actually the uh the uh, the, the the revised standard version that's what we were using in seminary and so I would have used that version to outline that entire book. And so I may not have come up with exactly what they came up with, but using the Messiah, uh, Immersed Messiah Bible, this is what they came up with was a center theme. And so they said the center of this book in Messiah, pages uh, 408 to 411, they're saying that D is the central thought or the central theme 
uh, of the book. And then as you as you as you go in, you got chorus corresponding <clears throat> corresponding themes like the A's correspond, the B's correspond, the C's correspond, and then of course the D is the central theme. And uh, I know it's kind of difficult to understand, but that's really the whole concept is to help you uh, understand the relationship of the whole book, the unity of the whole book, um, how it flows and what, what, holds, um, um, what holds the central thoughts, the central themes of, of the entire book. So Brina, I hope that helped you a little. Um, maybe, maybe it would be easier um, if one day I teach y'all how to do that uh, to a book, how to actually outline a book using this technique. Uh, and then, you know, it'll be a lot clearer. So, you know, for some people, it's easier to actually do it, to understand it, uh, than to read about it or see it, you know. Uh, so it helped me because I'm not just one that can just read it and get it. You know, I like to read it and, and, and do it in order to really get the uh, deeper understanding of what the world is going on. But uh, yeah, and so that's what they're saying. Um, the way the Messiah lays out the book of John, the central thought is Jesus as a new Moses against the backdrop of Exodus. Now, if you looked at what Chuck Swindoll said, that wasn't that wasn't the central, central theme. That wasn't the central thought. So he outlined the book differently you know and so that's why i said you know you can uh anybody you know if i did it like i said i probably would come out with something a little different but uh all of it's to help you get a clear an understanding uh of the book and the relationship of the text how it how you know the unity uh of the whole book how everything flows so uh hopefully that helped you out a little bit it did. It did. Kenny has hey, something. Yeah, uh, Kevin. So that's so those references are uh, like A, B, C, D, and those references actually actually in the Book of John, right? You know. Yes. In the Book of John, you can go. Yes. Through. Every one of them. Every one of them is. As a matter of fact, um, what they're saying is, and like for instance, A being an example, they're saying pages four uh, hundred to four hundred two. This is the theme of those pages of that reading. And the theme of those pages is Jesus in light of the new creation. That's what they're saying that theme is. And then of course, the next one, it says from uh, page 42 to 46, Jesus in relationship to the temple. So they're saying on these pages, every one of those pages has something to do with Jesus relationship to the temple. And so as you go through uh, and you see, like I was saying, the relationship of the bees, you go to B down on the bottom, where it's going out to the end of the book, they're back at Jesus in relationship to the temple uh, dedicated festival. But they tied it to uh, these pages are gonna have something to do with Jesus in the temple. So that's how they um, outline. This is how they outline the entire book so that you can see the unity of the book and catch the clear themes of the book. So uh, yeah, every one of these is in the book. And as you go through, as we go through this reading, you're actually gonna see that. You're actually gonna see that. If you go back, if you refer back, like when, the next time we come together, we'll be doing pages 400 uh, to 402. And you'll see that those pages are all talking about uh, the new creation. You know, it has something to do with the, the new creation. Because that's kind of a thing. And so you can always refer back so that you can see um, how the book flows. And it will help you get a deeper understanding of the book of John as well. Any other questions? Nada? Okay. Y'all got a lot of uh, uh, great, great material. I hope y'all can encourage uh, folks to uh, do a watch party or tune in, zoom in, uh, because this book, this is this is the book. If you remember when we were doing uh, 
evangelism and we were going out, uh, if we led someone to the Lord and even in the church, if we led someone to the Lord, we gave them a new uh, uh, a salvation kit, a kit for new converts. And in that kit was a small book of John, if y'all remember. It was a small book of John that we gave them as well because John's book was like the perfect book for helping new believers understand foundational things about Christianity, foundational things when it comes to Christ and salvation uh, and everything. I mean, everything's in there. Uh, so, I mean, it's like a, the perfect book uh, for new believers.